In 1968, Pope Paul VI wrote an encyclical letter called Humanae Vitae. This is a um, letter that teaches, um, you know, various Catholic principles. And this one had to do with the issue of contraception, abortion, sterilization, that sort of thing. It was a really terrific uh, document on marriage and family life and relationships between spouses. And, and at the end of the encyclical letter, he, he, he kind of recognized that maybe we didn't have all the solutions uh, at that time, but he asked for people to get involved and men of science and physicians and healthcare professionals were two of the groups that he asked to get involved. And then when Pope Paul VI died, that was uh, in August of 1978 actually, and my wife and I turned to each other and because he had requested men of science and physicians to become involved in this work, we decided to build an institute uh, uh, after his name and in response to these these requests on his part to to develop the Pope Paul VI Institute for the Study of Human Reproduction, which is one of the things he really wanted to have done. He wanted to have more research in these areas. And so we thought we, we, sh we could respond to that, and we made that pledge, actually. This was 1978. The Institute didn't actually open until 1985, but um, it took us a while to get there. But uh, we finally made it, and it's been, uh, it's been going ever since. It was founded on a prayer, basically. We sort of stumbled over a way in which we could standardize all of the language and the observations that these women were making and then charting, and the standardization meant everything. So we began having, I began having all my patients chart their cycles. If they have infertility or miscarriages or premenstrual syndrome or recurrent ovarian cysts, whatever it might be. And so after doing that for about 15 years, we began to realize that there was a common connection here between many of these uh, conditions and that we then began doing hormone studies and ultrasound studies and laparoscopies which is a diagnostic study of things like endometriosis, polycystic ovaries, adhesions, that sort of thing. And we began putting all this together and <clears throat> I wrote a little book called The Medical Applications of Natural Family Planning in 1991. The subtitle of that book was A Physician's Guide to Napro Technology. It was the first time that the term had ever been used and it pulled together a way in which you could evaluate and then treat things like infertility, recurrent miscarriage, a whole variety of conditions actually, in a way in which you didn't suppress the cycle, you didn't destroy embryos, you didn't freeze embryos, you didn't do all the things that are part of what really has become the current approach to the treatment of these within our profession. Some people refer to it as a culture of death because it has developed and literally become a, a medical force which basically destroys. What we were doing was cooperating with the cycle, understanding the, my wife likes to call it the mysteries of the menstrual cycle, the underlying causes, the root causes of these problems. And once we found those, then we could treat them. And uh, it was a kind of a win-win situation for the women because they not only, many of them at least got pregnant because that was one of their goals, but they also uh, felt better. Their medical conditions had been treated, whereas up until this time, they've been ignored. After uh, starting at Pope Paul VI Institute, I realized really quickly that, you know, I was really gonna enjoy my work as a women's health nurse practitioner. Um, it's, it's amazing, and I think over the last 13 years, as I look back, you know, it's, it's even more profound in terms of what you see going on uh, in women's health and how uh, that impacts women, but not just women, it impacts families. But when I think about feminism in, in respect to what I do here, I really think about how knowing your body and understanding your fertility and especially as a gift, of course, that God has given us. But understanding your fertility, even from a biological um, level, empowers you as a woman to first and foremost take charge of your own health. And that, as women, we just don't have. And so, you know, add that into a culture where in women's health, all we use is suppressive medicine. And, you know, I look at it as suppression, manipulation, and destruction. Um, that's kind of the mentality in women's health. If you come into a doctor and you have cycle-related problems, they're not really looking to help you fix those problems. 
they're looking to kind of suppress your body so that they don't have to deal with those problems or you don't have to deal with those problems. And it becomes a really easy thing to do. That's a whole different paradigm shift from what we do here at Pope Paul VI. Um, what we do is, because we don't you know, have to use any of those medicines, um, and we choose not to, of course, because we believe that you know, there's better ways to do this, um, that we actually are looking to investigate what's wrong with those women, what's wrong with their cycles, and to correct them, and to work cooperatively with it. Because the, that system, the reproductive system, the fertility system, it's not a disease itself. Uh, it should function normally, just like our heart functions normally, just like our lungs function normally. And if there's something wrong with it, you don't shut it down. Your goal is to correct the system. And so in women's health, that's the way we look at it. You know, this is not something we want to manipulate or destroy or suppress for the next 15 years. We actually want to correct and to cooperate with it, just like any other part of our body. And, um, and empowering women to first and foremost know their cycles allows them to take that first step is, okay, well, I know myself and I know my body and I know there's something not right here. And I can actually kind of explain this to you. And I'll tell women, you know, when you start to take uh, part of your own fertility and learn and educate yourself, that you all probably know more than your OBGYN does about your menstrual cycle. Of course, we work with a lot of patients who deal with infertility and repetitive loss. And, and that's another area where there's a lot of joys and there's a lot of sorrows that you're dealing with. And of course, our ultimate goal is to help them receive the blessing of joy of new life. But, uh, you know, it's never 100% we can tell people. We can never say, well, we're 100% going to give you that, that baby you've always wanted. That's just not the way life works. You know, we're doing our best to find the cures for infertility and our success rates are incredible. Um, and so we do everything we can to help these people, but you're, you're also going to work through a lot of sorrows with them. And that may be waiting a long time for that first baby. Or you're, you're with them when the joy uh, that they have when they find out they're pregnant for the first time. You know, and that's an incredible experience. So uh, the work that we do here is really rewarding, again, because we're dealing with life we're dealing with love and we're dealing with families and the uniting of those families and and helping them receive the blessings that God's want that God wants to give them. And we feel like we're cooperating with God in that. So working with these patients and helping them in the way that we do, in a way which uh, doesn't violate anybody's conscience, in a way which is successful medically, in a which, way which is successful in helping them with their families is is really a tremendous work and uh, I have no doubt about that and I've felt that way for a very long time so you know I've said before that we want to become a male clinic for the treatment of reproductive evaluation treatment of reproductive issues but from a Catholic moral and ethical point of view